Thank you, Eric, and everybody who's uh, participated today. Aren't you glad that a lot of people participate in the worship service? No. I am. We're even going to have uh, a couple more people. We're going to have Carly and Matthew come a little later and actually end the sermon for us today. <laughs> Okay. We're going to do that. Shh, nobody listen now. We're going to do that fake thing when I point it to you and you change it. It looks like I'm doing it. Okay. That's why this week I should be buying my iPad like my senior pastor has. Can I get a witness here? Amen. Hey, before I begin, and, and, you know, that was a, a serious scripture that we read, and we're going to revisit that in a little bit. But uh, today, our senior pastor is, you know, he's in Minnesota, and uh, he's visiting family there, and uh, I'm not so sure he has any cooler weather than we're having here, the way the Midwest has been going. And also, um, my wife has left me to be to be in Packwood with her parents for about 48 hours. So I, she needs a break from me. <laughs> Amen. And uh, I thought you'd say that. Um, anyway, so some very important people to me are missing today, but uh, but there are three very important people who are here this morning. I want to let them know that we welcome them. Would you do that with me? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus, Holy Spirit, thank you for always working together for our benefit. We have sung praises to you. We've heard stories, at least uh, one terrific story about how you are really involved in our lives. We have given a little bit of what you've given to us back to you as part of our worship. And Lord, we thank you for the songs that we can sing. And we do thank you that uh, your grace really is enough for us in the various ways that you extend it. Right now, I ask, Lord, that for everybody here, especially me, you just close us in a heavenly atmosphere. You surround us all with your angels because I believe, as you have already spoken in this worship service, you yet want to speak. So may that take place and may you give us hearing in Jesus' name. Have you ever met a very famous person? How many of you have met a very famous person? Let me see your hands. Really? Only about eight or ten of us? Maybe, the, how many of you don't like to raise your hands? Yeah, there you go. Okay, I have a feeling go somewhere here. Um, it is amazing the emotions we get as human beings when we encounter what really is, when you boil it all down, another human being sometimes, right? We get some pretty crazy and strange emotions, and we can do some pretty crazy and strange things uh, as a reaction. Uh, I'm thinking of a particular guy. Do you know this fellow above me? Mr. Redford, first name of Robert. I hear more female voices there than I hear male voices. <laughs> I wonder why. I specifically chose a little bit older pictures so there wouldn't be too many lost minds here uh, of a particular gender. But he's still good looking, amen? Amen. Robert Redford certainly was in a lot of pictures. I'm thinking of a particular film he was in. Uh, he was in this particular city and always putting in a long, hard day's work. A lot of it was shot in the downtown area of this city. And one evening, after putting in a grueling day, many, many hours of filming and takes and retakes, he decided to visit what he had seen during the shooting. That was a particular ice cream shop. He went that evening to this ice cream shop. And in front of him was a woman. As she ordered her particular item, she was totally oblivious to the fact that her favorite actor and not just for his acting ability, was standing behind her. And so she placed her order, Robert Redford is directly behind her, and after she ordered, she walked away, just to the side, 
and as he stepped forward, she caught a glimpse of him, and oh boy, the heart Twitter patience began. But she told herself, no, nope, no, nope, I've got to compose myself. And she did a relatively good job while the server got her order and brought it to the register. She acted very cool, very collected, and she paid for her order and thanked the server, and you know, she walked out of the, the ice cream parlor. And not too many steps after exiting onto that sidewalk, she was very much congratulating herself and how she had kept her composure during this time when she was extremely excited. But this self-congratulations was pretty well cut short when she realized she did not have the ice cream cone she had ordered. <laughs> What do you think happened? She was a little bit too excited. So she took a deep breath and she entered that store she had exited just seconds ago. And upon entering, she noticed that right near the register, right next to the register, Robert Redford was sitting at the counter enjoying his ice cream. So once again, she said, okay, you can do this, you can do this. So she acted very nonchalant as she stepped up to the register and said to the server, excuse me, I believe I left my ice cream here. And right after she said that, she heard Mr. Redford's voice saying, <clears throat> excuse me, ma'am, but I believe you will find it if you look in there. And he pointed to her purse. <laughs> <laughs> True story. Sure enough, the lady looked down, and there in her purse was her ice cream cone. I wonder to myself if she had that kind of response just meeting this celebrity at the ice cream shop. What would have happened? What would happen if Robert Redford showed up and stayed a little while at her house? I wonder how many embarrassing things she might say or do in that kind of extended situation, right? Jesus did not begin his healing, teaching, preaching ministry as a celebrity. However, shortly after he began that ministry, he pretty much obtained that status, even though that was not a goal he had in mind. That is the status he attained. People all over were talking about him, and you could understand that. Could you imagine somebody going around teaching as no other spiritual teacher ever did, speaking, as some are recorded in the Bible as saying, as never another man spoke, and healing miraculously, so it's no surprise to us that he attained that celebrity status, even though that was not his goal. His goal was to reveal who God truly was to people and to extend to them the gift of salvation. Praise God for that. Amen? But he did attain this celebrity status. And all throughout his public ministry, while he did many activities, he did visit with people. And he often visited them either in small groups or even one-on-one, -on -one, and sometimes even coming to their home. Imagine that. Not just at an ice cream shop, not just at his former carpenter shop, but at their homes. And we have at least one case recorded where he invited himself. He didn't wait for an invitation. We'll talk about some of those encounters, but think of this for a moment. Just like that lady in the ice cream parlor, and just as those people that we read about in the Gospels, people respond to other people according to their perception of him or her. Correct? You react, you respond, you interact, you relate to people depending on how you perceive them to be. Isn't that correct? For example, if you perceive someone to be a thief, you probably aren't going to invite them to watch your house or to stay in your house for the week while you're vacationing. Correct? You perceive them to be untrustworthy, dishonest. And so you're not going to do that. On the other hand, if you perceive them to be somebody of great high status, somebody who's actually above you in many ways, you will treat them with even greater respect than you do other people who you feel more equal. Isn't that correct? People did that with Jesus as well. People related to Jesus 
depending upon how they perceived him, who they perceived him to be, what they perceived him to be, maybe too. Let's think of some encounters that Jesus had with people. Name somebody that you know Jesus had an encounter with. I'd like to do that. This is kind of a Bible study. It's not just for me to spout up. Tell me somebody you can think of right off the bat that Jesus spoke to. Who? Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. Who would you say Jesus was to Zacchaeus? How did Zacchaeus perceive Jesus to be what? Short phrases or adjectives. To, to Zacchaeus, Jesus was what? A priest? A teacher, a celebrity, somebody he wanted to know, that's for sure, right? Zacchaeus was what kind of a man? <laughs> Did you hear what y'all just said? A wee little man in a tax collector. I like that. <laughs> Are we telling on ourselves here? Is it? He was a man of short stature, the Bible says. But I would imagine even people of a more normal stature found it hard to see Jesus because of the crowd that day. But we know that Zacchaeus was not just a tax collector. He was the chief of tax collectors. And all tax collectors just about were thieves. They took money for the Romans. And not only did they collect what they were supposed to, more often than not, they collected more. They were thieves. So Zacchaeus was a slimy, money-grabbing, somewhat heartless thief. And he is so good at it that he is the chief of tax collectors in this vast region. But he has this hunger. He has this void. And he's been hearing about Jesus. Maybe he even eavesdropped on some sermons. And he's got to see him this particular time. Jesus is coming through Jericho, literally on the way to Jerusalem for the last time. He's going to be crucified. And he climbs up in this tree. And what does Jesus say? I have got to come to your house today for a meal. Zacchaeus perceived Jesus to be somebody who not only can who not only presented a whole different kind of value system, but somebody who can cause that value system to be adopted by people. He saw Jesus as a life changer, and deep down under the crust of greed was a heart longing for somebody like that, for a life like that. Zacchaeus, this local tax collector, head of tax collectors, saw Jesus as a shall we say, a conscious cleanser? Come on, you know it when you've done something wrong. You usually don't need somebody to point it out to you. You've got a conscience that's doing that. And if that hasn't happened recently, you need to get it fixed. Nobody's perfect. Jesus was a conscience cleanser for him. Jesus was hope for a new and a livable value system. And so what was Zacchaeus' response? He totally was excited to have Jesus, and he totally opened himself up to this new power that was coming into his life, perhaps slowly, but maybe quickly, we might say, from this one encounter. So Zacchaeus rises from the dinner table, and he says, I will give half of my wealth to the poor, and if I have, if I have taken too much from someone, then I'm going to pay back not only that money, I'm going to pay it back four times, which is what we read in Exodus, was what a thief was supposed to do. So he's totally, his response is to be totally transparent before Jesus. And he says, yes, I'm a thief. I'm going to follow the, the law given to Moses, and I'm going to pay back four times the amount I have built people. Wow, what an encounter with the celebrity Jesus. Anybody else? What about Nicodemus? What was Nicodemus? It's a high-ranking spiritual leader in Israel, a member of the Pharisees. When Jesus encounters him, as recorded in John chapter 3, he calls him the teacher of Israel. That's pretty high esteem. Jesus was seen by Nicodemus as what? 
a teacher. A teacher unlike any other. And so Jesus is fascinating and yet somewhat disturbing to Nicodemus. And so what is his response? He's going to cautiously inquire. Are any of you there in your life? You don't want to admit it, but you really don't know Jesus. And there is this sense of, I don't know if I want to be that close, and yet there's this attraction at the same time. How do you respond? Nicodemus responded by cautiously inquiring. He needs to meet with Jesus, but he can't do it out in the open. And he's, he can't just address him as a regular person, but he can't really call him Messiah. So he calls him teacher, rabbi. What is his response? With this cautious attraction and fascination, he openly inquires of Jesus, and he even admits, I don't understand what you're talking about. But Jesus is there to answer, isn't he? He doesn't just say, huh, you're the teacher of Israel, you don't even know these things? Dude, get it together, okay? And then we can talk. Don't waste my time. You should be here already. Maybe you have felt God saying that to you. You should be here already. If that is God talking, I would submit to you, he doesn't do that in a way that makes you just feel sadness and hopelessness and so forth. If he points that kind of thing out, he says, we can do this. And he puts his arm around you. And he says, I'm giving you the power to do this. My grace is sufficient. What about uh, Mary of Magdala? What was she when she first met Jesus? Yeah, she's a hooker. Yes. She is someone who is used by people and someone who uses people. Right? That's how she made her money. She's being used. She's using them. What a life, huh? Where you feel like more of a thing than a human. But she's attracted to Jesus, right? Jesus to her was hope of a better life, just like for Zacchaeus and even Nicodemus, right? For Mary... Yeah, Jesus, I believe Jesus was encountering Mary in that story we read about where he wrote in the sand, the lady caught in adultery. I believe, in my Bible study, that that was Mary. And so what was Jesus to her when Jesus says to this crowd, yeah, the law says to stone such a woman. I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and begin. Now, the first stone should be thrown by the one who has no sin. Wow, boom, 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 the stone is dropped. She looks up, her accusers are gone. And what does he say? Neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Jesus is her defender. Jesus is her savior. And so what's her response? Wow, she is totally sold out. She puts her faith in Jesus. I believe she's one of the first to put her faith in him as the Messiah. And I dare say she understood what he was saying better than most people. She is so attracted to him. We read when Mary and uh, Lazarus and Martha were together, sisters and brother. She would sit at Jesus' feet, take this position of submission, and she just hung on every word that Jesus would say. That's how she responded to this celebrity. What about the woman at the well? This woman who is divorced five times and now she's living with a guy who's not her husband. And Jesus knows all of this and he reveals it to her. To her, Jesus was a prophet. Jesus saw with divine insight. And yet, while she felt his dislike for her lifestyle, she felt his love. For her as an individual, she felt accepted as an individual. Not her lifestyle accepted, but she was accepted. And she responded to that. And she goes from a woman who doesn't want to see anybody. That's why she's going to the well at noonday. Nobody else is going to the well. You don't go in the hottest part of the day. You go in the morning, you go in the evening when it's cooler. But she goes at the part of the day when she is least likely to encounter anybody. But now she wants to tell everybody, come. Meet this man who has told me everything about me. This must be the Messiah. She 
is so changed. Talk about, she becomes really the first evangelist. These encounters with Jesus. <laughs> what about the Pharisees? We read a little bit about them today already, right? Who was Jesus to them? A problem to be solved, yes. Competition. And their response was envy. Envy to the point that they wanted to get rid of. He was just an obstacle for them. Something to be taken out of the way, removed, so they could have what they sought the most. And what was most pleasing to them was to have this great reputation and fame in the community and look really good. And so they plotted, and eventually they orchestrated the death of Jesus Christ. Wow. Some of you here today, you have never really accepted Jesus Christ. So I want to point you to probably the most famous text in the Bible. For God, so let's read that together. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Some of you here today, you're here today, you're in a worship service. Maybe you go to worship services regularly, but you know that deep down you have not been fully transparent before him. You have not fully accepted him as your personal Savior, the one who took the guilt of every one of your wrongs to the cross and there died as you. And the Bible teaches that you died in Christ. In other words, the penalty is already done. You don't need to fear God's judgment. You don't need to fear God's judgment if you've accepted Christ because you've already taken it in Him according to the teaching. Read Romans, read Galatians, read Ephesians. It's pretty plain. I encourage you to contemplate this one. It's time to get serious about knowing Him. For yourself, you can't get to know Him simply through sermons or asking other people, though that's a good start. But where you do your homework, you spend time, and you just cry out to Him. Jesus, if you really are who you are, I want to know that. I want to experience you in this way. Some of you claim you've done that. And you are enjoying a wonderful life with Christ. And you are letting Him come into your life in deeper, ever-increasing ways. And that is wonderful. But some of us who've done that, who've accepted Christ several years ago, we get a little lazy. We start to think that the gospel, what Jesus did, is just about getting us from here to heaven and, and there's no nothing else really to take place in between. We're just here, we live in the world, we go to work, we pay our bills, we pay our tithe, we come to church. And we forget that it really requires a transformation. And some of us who go that far think that transformation comes about because we're striving for it and we work it and we muster up all the human power we can to achieve this higher level of character. And then we fall down on our faces. Like the Old Testament verse says, although about a different battle, but this, the, the principle applies. The battle, even over self and selfishness, is not ours, but it's God's. So we strive, yes, as Paul says, with every fiber of his being, knowing, though, that God is doing the bulk of the work. And our striving isn't to do the work of cleansing ourselves. Our striving is to keep our connection with Christ. That's our striving. He'll do the cleansing. We do the clinging. We submit and say, here I am. Give me that new heart. Take away, depending on your Bible version, that carnal, that sinful, that self-centered nature and replace it with your selfless one. That comes out in this particular text, one of my favorites. One of the first several vers verses that I ever memorized as a Christian. For the grace of God, I really like that song this morning, His grace is enough. The grace of God has appeared to how many of us? All of us, and it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. 
You have a temptation? Sometimes you're all alone. Maybe you should yell that out. You got that thought coming in? You know it shouldn't be there. It's not going to lead to anything good. No! If you do it in your car, it people look at you. Especially if your windows are down and it's a 90 degree day and you're out. We say no to ungodliness and worldly passions while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why did He give Himself for us? To redeem us, buy us back from all kinds of misalignments with God's will, wickedness, and to purify for Himself a people that are His very own, who are actually eager to do what is good. He is a total savior. He saves us from that selfishness that destroys relationships in our families with those around us. Even our relationship with ourselves. And for some of us as Christians, we have to admit that things aren't always what they appear to be, are they? Do you see that there? Do you know what that is called? You can see, can you see the word recorder on it? Can you see the word flight on it? So then you know it's a flight recorder. You wish you had me as a high school teacher. What is it called by the airline industry? The black box. And yet it's what color? Interesting. Some are even yellow. But we call it a black box. <laughs> Things are not always what they seem to be. This is a pretty famous painting. Remember what it's called? American Gothic. Of course, I would hear Kathy's voice first. This 1930 painting by Grant Wood. It depicts what? A husband and wife, what occupation? Farmer. Particularly in the Midwest. Was his home in Iowa? Somewhere in Iowa. So, this picture was claimed to portray a husband and wife who typified the straight-laced type of Midwestern farmer of the era. But things are not always what they appear to be. First of all, this isn't even a husband and wife. And they never stood in front of that house. They were seated while their pictures were painted. Actually, the lady, her name is Nan. And that was the painter, Grant Wood's sister. The guy in the picture is a friend of the painter. He was a dentist. And so he had them, he had them sit individually, and he sketched them out and eventually painted them. And by the way, that house, which isn't even, I believe, 600 square feet, in actuality, the, I think it's called the Dibble Home, um, the original builders and owners lost it. They couldn't pay their taxes and it switched hands several times. And even though it's supposed to depict this straight-laced Midwestern farmer's house, during the changing of hands, it was even used hmm, as a house of ill repute. Things are not always what they appear, are they? What about uh, this? What you see on the bottom there is a picture of what kind of shoe? That's a Nike, yes, but it's specifically a model called Air Jordan. Yes. Anybody here like Chicago? Not for the politics. This is the Air Jordan. That's the original 1985 version right there. And up in the corner you have the 2012 version. It continued to sell at quite a high price and lots of people wanted them. It was called Air Jordan for two reasons. Number one, it was Michael Jordan who made it famous and the guy was famous because he was one of the first, he and Dr. J, Julius Irving, they would run and jump towards the basketball hoop from such a distance it looked like they were just floating on air. It looks like they were continuing to go up when normal men would just be falling by that time. They'd already crossed it. Air. They call Michael his airness, right? And so the shoe is called Air Jordan for that reason, but there's a second reason. It was to have this pouch inserted in the sole, and in that pouch they injected air. The 
but the pouch didn't hold the air. The molecules of air were too small and they would go through the holes that were in the pouch, so they had to inject it and they've been doing it ever since with a different type of gas, but it's still called air even though it's not air. Ah, these guys. Yeah. What's in the middle of the picture? A surfboard. Why a surfboard? Surfing Safari. Remember that song? Surfing USA. I was wondering if I should even put, put this slide up because then I know some music is going to start in your head. But you can hear those melodies, many of us, right? The Beach Boys, these four guys led by Brian Wilson, were known for all these beach songs, many of which highlighted surfing. In fact, because of them in the 60s, surfing just, it was never higher than that. More and more people would go out and try to surf. Because these are the Beach Boys, they're all about surfing. The only problem is, not one of the four ever surfed. <laughs> and yet, out of their 80 million records sold, about 20 million of them were about surfing. But they never surfed. In fact, Brian Wilson, the one who wrote most of their songs and sang most of those songs, confessed in an interview he absolutely was frightened by why. <laughs> Things are not always what they appear to be. Sometimes our lives, even though we profess to be lives following Jesus, aren't quite that way, are they? Pontius Pilate received a visit by Jesus at his, quote, house. This celebrity of a rabbi, though heaven knew he was the Messiah, and a few people did, this celebrity of a rabbi was brought to the home of Pontius Pilate, this governor, the one who held the power of Jesus' human life in his hand. Earthly speaking. And in the interaction with the Pharisees and with the crowd, Pilate asked what is probably the most important question you and I could ever ask. What shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Christ and the Son of the Anointed One? What shall I do with Jesus? What shall I do with Jesus? That's an incredible question. How does it play out in people's lives? This is one of the ways it plays out. Carly and Matthew are going to show us. Yeah, that, that, that's uh, the cheetah, man. He's, he's the fastest of his kind. Really? 
So that, that's not exactly how I made it at first. You know, there was, when I made everything, there was no sin and no death and defeat. Well, this is kind of boring. Um, you want to talk about video games? <laughs> you know what? We could just talk, you know? It's been a, you know, since last time we've talked, I think you've grown a whole inch. Uh, no, no. Just, I, I, you know, we, we, were, we were going in the forest and, and that was just such a good